Hello, good morning, good evening, good night, good good afternoon, anything, uh, you know, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the mini summit uh, as part of Open Source Summit. And we're going to talk about LF Edge. Uh, as, uh, as I was saying when we were rehearsing, uh, we have the the best of the best brain power uh, all uh, here today at your service to answer any questions down from the bits and bytes of latency to the memory uh, requirements to the applications that are being used for edge edge is an extremely important topic for uh, almost everybody these days and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, quickly introduce uh, what we're going to do and how the scope is today. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar, I'm Arpit Joshpura, head up uh, LF Edge and networking at the uh, Linux Foundation. And we're going to sort of uh, talk about the big picture on Edge. Edge is four times the size of cloud computing. For those of you who have missed the cloud revolution, don't miss the edge revolution. And I'm so glad you are here today. And you will hear everything that Linux Foundation Edge is doing uh, to enable this uh, forward. And not just in LF Edge, but across the communities and standards uh, uh, throughout the globe. Let's start off with the definition of edge. This is a million dollar question, which has now become probably a hundred dollar question because we have figured it out as a community. Uh, this is a very important slide. You will see this uh, referred and issued as part of our State of the Edge, which is a top-level project under LF Edge. Uh, let me spend two minutes on this, and it will be very clear. So at the bottom of the screen, you have two big uh, you know, purple and, and teal things. There's a user edge and a service provider edge, right? And they bleed into each other. It's not a hard cut. But the general assumption from the community is the last mile separates the two. So then if you double click into the user or what is you know, under the control of a user, you may have constraints, you may have you know, devices that are smart or you will have on-prem type gear. Again, depends on the physical aspects, depends on location, depends on a whole bunch of factors. And then as you cross the first mile, you have uh, things like base stations, things like smart central offices, colos, et cetera. What we have concluded is anything that is kind of centralized, regional, all the way hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away, and what we say about 20 milliseconds of latency, that's not edge. Okay, so let's be very clear. Not everything is edge. And I always start off by saying, uh, you know, people say, you know, not all IoT is IIoT, not all edge is IoT, and then not all edge is the same, right? And so we have a series of projects here that span the various uh, types of uh, edge locations and edge edge uh, terminology here. Uh, we will go in detail on each of these projects, specifically starting with our stage three project, which are impact projects, EdgeX Foundry and Acrano, uh, as well as our stage two projects, which we'll get into uh, in the later part of the uh, of the of the uh, of the mini summit. But before we get into that, I want to spend a minute on showing you how Edge fits in with the rest of the open source and standards community. And this picture is, is putting it all, all out, right? You have on the left-hand side, you have all the traditional ways of entering a network, uh, you know, whether it's a telco network through ORAN or um, an enterprise network. And then that comes in through a core uh, sort of a network, right? Whether uh, whether it's a public cloud or a hosted cloud or or any of the interconnects, these logos are essentially projects that both Linux Foundation as well as our sister foundations, right? Whether it's OpenStack or, or Kubernetes or anybody, are hosting to enable end-to-end -end use cases, build using open source as the building blocks. And the thing that I want to emphasize here as part of LF Edge is we work extremely close with our consortiums uh, and standards organizations. So whether it's Etsy, Mac, ACC for the automo Automobile Edge consortiums or IIC, uh, it brings the total picture in perspective. And so the use cases we'll talk about today on these are all based on the projects that we discuss, right? Whether it's home edge for anomaly discussion, dis detection, or whether it's uh, DevOps at scale for Eve, or whether it's telco blueprints, AR, VR, or whether it's building automation, uh, or whether it's predictive maintenance. All these are being discussed today. 
So stay tuned and you know be be very attentive ask as many questions as you want we will be answering this towards the end of the mini summit and with that introduction i'm going to hand it over to our first presenter uh and uh, the tsc chair for the ukraine edge stack Kandan. take it away thank you Arpet. thanks for a great introduction into the lf edge and i welcome everyone to this uh, summit and this is Kandan Kadrivel, TSE Chair for Akrainoid Stack. So I'm going to talk about uh, what is Akrainoid Stack and uh, how, how it is actually delivering a solution to support uh, different uh, edge stacks. Uh, so you can see this picture, all edge uh, deployments are not same and they have a different requirements from a power cooling, uh, different sizes of requirements and latency, the security needs, and other aspects like automations and even the connectivity, what goes into those uh, deployments. So when we talk about uh, these different type of deployments, you know, you do need a fully integrated solution that can actually can be deployed into this multiple type of edge location. So for example, it could be a customer location where a different varieties of uh, edge compute goes in. Then you have access location primarily to support RAM and connectivity. Then you have a telco network edge where the telco uh, deployments that including core as well as you know supporting workloads for uh, other customers as well. So we have a different requirements with respect to all this you know edge computing. The fact is that you know like uh, there was no uh, fully integrated solution before a crinoid stack, and uh, we will talk a little bit about uh, what is exactly a crinoid stack is delivering that supporting this different type of, of edge computing. Uh, you can see the mission of uh, a Crinoid stack. Uh, there are four key items that this community is focused on. One is to provide this end-to-end -end stack by taking different open sources and doing a development with respect to the Crinoid stack and bringing a cohesive edge solution for the deployment. So we call it collectively as a blueprint. Then we also have a projects where uh, specifically enhances you know, features uh, in of the components that goes into the edge stack. And that including, you know, security scanning, that including, you know, the items like uh, automated tools to deploy this particular location, operational tools, for example, those sort of items, you know, we call them as a feature project. Then as Arpit pointed out, it is very important to uh, collaborate with all the communities that are developing different edge, uh, you know, parts of the edge solution. And uh, we work with a lot of upstream community that including Voran, uh, you know, open a lot of open source like uh, OpenStack, a uh, lot of project within LF Edge and uh, um, CNCF and many other open source community. We work very closely with them to bring an end-to-end -end solution uh, that can satisfy different edge cloud needs. And we also work with a lot of vendors and they are uh, heavily engaged in Akrino to actually take these tags and support them for the end user who is actually doing this deployment. So. So if we see this particular picture, it explains, you know, like uh, how and how many people are actually involved uh, in the Akrainoid stack. So we have 40 plus companies has been engaged with respect to Akrino and uh, the 70 percentage of the LFH members uh, are contributing to this project. Uh, so the Akrino community with respect to the uh, releases, they have delivered a solution, edge solution, like a fully integrated, tested, and in actual labs in Akrino, and they have been validated to uh, specific use cases, and that including wide varieties of use cases, either it is a telco or it's an enterprise applications, they are all validated by the community and readily available for download. And the uh, yeah, full-fledged documentation is given for the user in explaining how this particular stack will work with respect to a specific hardware and what is being tested and what are the results and stuff like that. The solution includes all those edges that I talked about. Also, it includes the enterprise applications like connected cards and stuff like that, which we will see in the next slide. So before we go into the specific blueprint, I do want to talk about a little bit about what does the blueprint really mean? Because we use this terminology quite a bit and I just talked about the fully integrated stack. Uh, the blueprints are not just a paperwork. Uh, this is a full integrated solution. The full stack that comes, you know, like in the form of like a community integrated, tested, and fully deployable and end-to-end -end stack. 
which has like application integration. And this is all, all use case driven. Yeah, specific use case of edge computing is being taken into this uh, blueprint as a requirement. And uh, then the community integrates them to support for that particular use case. And it is a fully tested in the community. This is a very key aspect of it because majority of the open source, you know, they develop them, but they really don't put them into a testing of all kinds of testing. It could be a security testing, uh, CI, CD testing, and all sort of testing that is needed to make sure that this particular solution can really a production deployable one. And that's what this community does it. It verifies the blueprint in the multiple uh, real hardware uh, implementation. Then the community provides a life, like a life cycle support for this blueprint, and we do ensure the production quality of this blueprint. And in terms of the community, the community has uh, established a wonderful procedure that has been taken and applied to this blueprint whenever they make into the release. The intention here is to provide a low cost, large scale deployment, zero touch provisioning, and uh, a full industry adoption and based on fully open source and that including white boxes that can be used for this deployment. So that's what we collectively call as a blueprint. That's a key deliverable of, uh, of uh, Rhino. And you can see this picture. So primarily it is talks about the, uh, the blueprint landscape that uh, Rhino has delivered with respect to uh, Rhino release two. And Rhino release two was actually delivered in January, 2020. And that including the enhancement to the R1 blueprints. And you can see the map here. It starts from the left hand side with the thin and the, uh, thick gateways, uh, which goes to the customer location. Then you have in the right hand side, uh, that is the telco and cloud edge. And you have a solution in between, which basically provides, you know, like a multiple blueprints uh, focused on specific use cases. Some of those blueprints can support multiple use cases, but you know they have a primary use case that they are well tested within the community. And uh, that's what this uh, R2 have delivered. Uh, we are working on the R3 and uh, it's supposed to come in July, 2020. And uh, that's going to have like more blueprints and enhancements and features to the R2 blueprints. And we are pretty excited as a community to deliver this R3. And this is exactly what uh, the industry needs. Either it is a telco or enterprise, uh, you know, both both the sectors, you know, like can leverage these blueprints. And we do already see a lot of production deployment of these blueprints by the users. And the Akraino community already published, you know, like who's using that. And we are working further with the user community uh, to do a more user stories uh, during the R3, which would articulate, you know, like who's using all these blueprints. Uh, but uh, the community is quite excited about R3 because it's bringing up, you know, like a lot of innovation uh, in terms of many, many, many uh, applications that are uh, can be supported using these blueprints. And uh, how do you can engage, get engaged? Uh, this particular uh, page has, you know, links. Uh, there is a many ways you can actually get engaged. You do not need to be a member of LF Edge or a Rhino to join the community uh, participation. Uh, either to contribute a project or actively involved in any project. All the discussion in the community is open and anybody can actually join. And uh, you can see that there are multiple community calls. There is a community calendar uh, in which you can see all the calls that's happening with respect to the community, but you can actually start with the TSE calls and the community call where, you know, like uh, publicly we share a lot of information about innovations happening in this project. Uh, that happens on uh, Thursday, uh, 6 to 7 a.m. PST. And uh, you can also see these links where you can actually find additional details that including the mailing list, uh, you know, the list of blueprints, and the wiki has all the details and recordings of the previous uh, events, as well as the calls that uh, the Carino community have done. And uh, we welcome you guys to the community. Again, this is a, a rightly needed community to support the edge computing need and uh, the 5G deployment and all the cool applications that's happening in the industry that including, you know, like connected cards, uh, AR, VR and all the stuff. So there's a lot of ex exciting and, uh, you know, a lot of innovation happening in this community. You are welcome to join us and participate in this community. So with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Jim and he's going to talk about Edgex Foundry, Jim. 
Hey, thanks, Conan. Really appreciate it. Hi, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed uh, a wonderful OSS ELC. Really happy to be here with you today and uh, with my fellow LF Edgers. I'm Jim White, CTO of IOTech and the TSC Chair of EdgeX Foundry. I want to kind of give you a quick flyby of EdgeX, what it is, what it does, and our current momentum and roadmap and how you can learn a little bit more. Um, so specifically, EdgeX Foundry is an open source vendor neutral project and ecosystem. We think the ecosystem is just as important as the project itself, as you see with all the people represented here today from our LF Edge community. Um, our application is a microservice loosely coupled framework. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that and why that is important, we think, to the platform. We're both hardware and OS agnostic. Yep, we run on Intel, we run on ARM, we run on um, Ubuntu, Mac OS, Windows, you name it, uh, we run on it. And of course, we are a Linux Foundation Apache 2 project. If you're not familiar with open source licensing, Apache 2 is the license that says this is business friendly. Take it, use it, uh, do as you need with it to help create IoT solutions. And we were started back in 2017. So what does all that mean? Uh, well, I like to boil it down for people. Uh, essentially, EdgeX Foundry is uh, middleware. It's middleware for the edge, allowing you to connect your things of your IoT and edge world into your enterprise, into your cloud systems, but also provide the actuation, the command and control back down, and importantly, provide intelligence or the ability to intertwine intelligence and analytics at the edge as well. And we'll talk a bit about that. So without getting into a lot of details, given the short amount of time today, again, it's a project that was started back in 2015 uh, when I was at Dell. We've got uh, members online here. In fact, Jason Shepard is online who were instrumental in getting that project launched. And then we turned it over at Dell to the open source community to Linux Foundation in April of 2017, uh, where it's been ever since. Um, Today, again, we've got a lot of companies that participate as part of the project, and some of them are represented online with us. Our cadences we release twice a year. We just got done with releasing what we call the Geneva release in May of this year. Um, so that was our sixth community release and we're due and on track now for release coming out in the fall um, around October, which we call Hanoi. If you haven't detected by the naming schema there, we kind of follow a uh, naming scheme is similar to, to Android, A, B, C, D, E, F type of thing where our names are named not after suites, but after some sort of geolocation. With regard to our project then, um, what's it about? Well, this is the architecture. This is the microservice collection um, that makes up EdgeX. Each of the boxes you see here is one of the services that's currently part of EdgeX. And the idea is there are a set of services at what we call the south side, the bottom uh, row of little boxes you see that help digest the data, ingest data from sensors and devices and make that available to cloud and enterprise. But just as we have the ability to ingest data, we also have analytics inside of our environment. We provide a, a default rules engine, but you could put whatever analytics, local analytics you'd like there to allow for command and control back down to the devices and sensors. So again, it's a two-way street where we provide the ingestion of data from the edge, but also allow for command and control and allowing you to provide your own analytics. As a microservice architecture, any one of the boxes you see here on the screen is something you can replace with your own code if you so desire. We provide a collection of what we call reference implementation services out of the box, but the flexibility to provide your value add where you see fit, and given our Apache 2 license, allows you to do that in a fashion you deem necessary. So if you kind of break it down or boil it down, what EdgeX is again is middleware, uh, providing the connectivity tissue between the things, the the edge, and then your enterprise, your cloud, whatever is in your IT world. And we provide essentially a dual transformation engine. Transformation of the south side protocols where you've got things like Modbus and BACnet and BLE and communicate that northward to applications where, yes, they speak TCP IP, but as we all know, not all clouds speak the same, not all enterprise applications and database speak the same. So providing that dual transformation from the thing world into your enterprise and your cloud world. Again, so we look at it as being a, a transformation engine and one where we're transferring thing protocols into uh, IT data formats and structures uh, as you see fit. We are a, a mechanism because of our microservice architecture as well. We lay on top of whatever types of resources you have available. Well, we built uh, EdgeX uh, coming out of Dell with the idea that, hey, it's gonna fit on things like our IoT gateways. 
But from a community standpoint, uh, and because of our microservice-based architecture, you can deploy EdgeX across whatever type of compute storage and network you have. Its microservice architecture allows you to lay down the various services from the things all the way to the cloud of the enterprise, wherever it seems to make the most sense. We're seeing a trend in the industry of trying to get intelligence closer to that thing, that um, device or sensor out there. But there are other elements, things like maybe your analytics, which are going to be a little bit closer to the cloud, or at least somewhere deployed in what used to be called the fog, and as we're now trying to, to deem it, uh, a more rich layer of the edge. Our project has considerable momentum. In fact, these statistics were put together as we were putting together this collection of talks for today. And so some of the data needs to be updated a little bit. Um, but we have about 180 contributors into EdgeX today. That's actually about, I think, close to 200 right now in July of 2020. We actually have six and a half million container downloads today. And we think or estimate somewhere around um, 350 to 400,000 deployments. So we've got a growing community. We've got a growing adopter and user base, and we'd love to see you be a part of either, either contributing to help make EdgeX or as an adopter using EdgeX in your Edge solution. Our cadence has said, as I said before, was uh, twice a year. Um, and we've got a long history behind us already with the six community releases. We do have a rich roadmap out there. Again, I mentioned Hanoi as being on the uh, docket for this fall. Uh, we're going to be looking to improve things like the APIs. We're going to be adding uh, more message bus capability. Lots of details out there on our wiki site, which I'll bring up here in just a second. So if you're interested in joining our project, know that we've got uh, a rich history, but also a bright future. Some key links that you'll want to be uh, familiar with if you start to look at uh, the project, and I do hope you will. Um, take a look at our code base in GitHub, obviously, um, as all open source efforts. Got to have that code to start to peek at and understand what we do. We also have technical documentation online, as well as having things like um, our, our videos and tutorials online. We've got a blog site. We've got email and Slack channels, as most of the projects in LF Edge do. Please reach out to me through uh, Slack if you do have additional questions or would like a little bit of a deeper dive. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason Shepard from the EVE project. And I want to thank all of you and uh, wish you the best and have you have a great conference. All right. Thanks, Jim. Um, always good to uh, see my partner in crime starting EdgeX back in the day. And it just, I mean, the, the, what they're talking about, what Jim talked about is really just the power of open source and, and collaboration. And, and of course, I mean, we're talking about a variety of projects here. And this is really about, as Arpit said, how do we kind of harmonize over time, but also recognize you know, where, where these projects need to be different. And, and a key part of open source, you know, as, as we all know, is, is this notion of a shared technology investment that helps people uh, uh, avoid what I call undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, we need to be focusing on value. Uh, but then the other key thing here is driving, um, you know, enabling innovation and, 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 and while we're also uh, facilitating interoperability. So of course that's a key effort of the EdgeX project. EdgeX is an application layer. Acrano, of course, is, as Conan talked about, is about blueprints and help to kind of bring things together both upstream and downstream. Um, project Eve is actually a, a project that's below um, the, the, the EdgeX application layer. This, this is all about providing a, a very consistent foundation for deploying compute um, at what we call the IoT Edge. And, I, and I'll talk about that a little bit more detail, kind of get a little more granular on the, um, uh, the landscape here. So um, next slide. OK, so at a high level, what is, what is Project Eve? You know, think of Eve as a kind of bare metal computing engine. It is not about the applications itself. It's really about that lower level uh, device um, and application orchestration, the security of those uh, devices. And this could be running on a, you know, an edge gateway, a server outside of a secure data center, just any kind of distributed compute. Um, it, it supports VMs, uh, containers. So if you've got a legacy workload, you want to run in a, in a virtual machine, maybe it's a SCADA application, um, maybe a point of sale system that runs on Windows, you know, you can still run those on this, but you can also run modern uh, containerized applications. Uh, so we, we really want to kind of be that universal foundation uh, that provides those extra networking and security benefits that we'll talk a bit more um, with your choice of hardware applications and clouds. Of course, the whole point of LF Edge is to create these projects that are valuable independently, but better together. Uh, you, you choose what you want to use with it. And of course, you know, it's all about creating these open APIs 
that prevents you know, lock in. It helps you kind of uh, maximize your value add. You of course add your 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 specific commercial interest on top. You know, it's, this is also of course about commercial stuff. But again, that shared technology investment not only helps you focus your efforts, but also drive um, um, interoperability and, and and scale through a, an open ecosystem. Okay, so this is actually a, a teaser for a white paper that we're releasing next week. Um, through the LF Edge, uh, we, we worked as a community and, and came up with this new taxonomy. Um, some people are like, oh, God, another another edge taxonomy. Like, you know, it's the old Sanders joke. How do you fix the Sanders problem? We'll come up with one more standard. Um, but this is a new new taxonomy and, and it's a very different approach. And we've had really good feedback on this, you know, uh, as a community from, you know, the analysts out there and whatnot, because this is different. Instead of saying things like near and far and thin and thick and whatever, you know, kind of terms that mean different things to different people, this talks about absolute technical trade-offs. Are you on a WAN or a LAN relative to the process? You will never deploy your airbag from, from the WAN, uh, regardless how fast and reliable those networks are. And we know that they're, they're quite reliable. Uh, is it in a physically secure data center or not? Um, you know, when you're outside of a data center, whether it's a smartphone or a, an IoT gateway or a sensor you know, device, um, you have different considerations. You need a zero trust model, you have different skill sets, et cetera. You know, is it is it capable of running application abstraction in the form of VMs or containers, uh, you know, apps like in the iOS or Android sense, or can it not? These are the hard inherent technical trade-offs across this continuum. And let's face it, it's a continuum. And industrial, enterprise, consumer, they all sit on top of this with their specific needs. But these absolute um, trade-offs never, ever change. You're always right if you talk about absolute trade-offs. So just, you know, it's important to think about this, you know, read the white paper when it comes out, um, there'll be some press on it next week, but you know, Eve, Project Eve is focused on the smart device edge, meaning two things. I am outside of a physically secure data center, but I can still run apps. So on the left side of the smart device edge, and it's called smart device edge because it includes PCs, client, mobile devices, you know, mobile devices of course have Android and iOS. On the left side of this is, is a memory constraint of 256 megs to 512 megs of memory. Below that, you must go embedded. Everything gets really, really constrained and, and you know, custom. On the right side, think of this as small server clusters. You know, so Kubernetes is coming down from the cloud. It's kind of just taking the world by storm over here. We're seeing great work with K3S, but you need some unique things because you're getting outside of a data center. You're getting to constrained devices. So, so we're kind of bridging that gap in, a, in, in, a, in, in the community. And, and of course, it's about open collaboration to get there. So again, think of Eve as doing for the IoT edge, these headless IoT gateways and servers and hubs and routers in the wild, outside of physically secure data centers, uh, creating that abstraction layer. Think of it doing for the IoT edge what Android did for mobile. So these are just some quick parallels. Uh, and these slides are actually, versions of these slides are in the project. You know, I know we've only got a short period of time today. So, so, you know, there, there's a very specific approach that we took here as a community. Um, you know, Eve is a bare metal foundation. Now you can run Eve in a in a VM, you know, just as well, but you get the benefits of security functions, you know, tied to the root of trust in that hardware if it's available, uh, distributed firewall. I mean, literally, you know, we, we, with Eve, you can uh, use that open API with your controller of choice in the back end and govern, you know, this app can only talk to that app on the box, this app can only talk to that cloud. Um, I can lock down individual ports, maybe you don't want USB ports accessible because they're out in the field, um, but you want to open them for a, t a technician that wants to go install something. So very specific needs, lots of detail online about it, um, but this bare metal foundation gives you a lot of flexibility and that open API that links to Eve gives you complete um, uh, control over what you do and no lock-in to the proprietary method. So, if you look at the top right, there's a lot of stuff out there that's, that, that you know, has extraction you know, available, you know, supports VMs or some new, new efforts that are doing VMs and containers, uh, kind of this hybrid cloud native approach, um, you know, good stuff. But you know, if you're an end user and you use that, those solutions, they have a proprietary API, meaning you get locked into that solution. You have no choice but to use that controller. And so Eve, of course, with the open API, you choose, um, you know, which controller you use. Um, you know, my company, we offer an offer, but we, we welcome, um, you know, other folks to go build their own. In fact, we're collaborating, um, you know, with folks like Open Horizon with, that just came with Elf Edge and, you know, like, hey, you know, we want to go enable other options because this is about floating all boats and, 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 you know, rising tides float all boats. The other thing, you know, that to look at, the other approach is this notion of an agent-based solution. An agent-based solution means, you know, I've got an agent running on top of the OS. And, and that agent does the coordination to, down to the hardware through the OS and of course to the, to the apps alongside it. The problem with this approach, I mean, there's, there's some good solutions out there, but the problem with this approach is that you don't get the benefits of security elements if you're not bare metal. 
if you need to integrate that agent very tightly with every OS you use, and of course with, with Eve, you can use whatever guest OSs you want. And, and a lot of the options out there only support containers, um, you, you know, and, and the proprietary variants, of course, there's both open source and proprietary here. Proprietary variants create lock-in. If you do all the integration between the agent and the OS to make sure you don't brick that device out in the field and have to drive a truck to spend $1,000 and spend $1,000 to fix it, if you, if you don't do that integration, you're going to have these gaps in security, uh, um, risk of bricking, et cetera. If you integrate the agent with the OS, well, guess what? You just built Eve. And so that's what we're doing as a community. And you know, we welcome anybody to kind of get involved and, and make this sort of like the, again, the Android of, of the IoT Edge. Uh, real quick, I won't go through all of this because I want to make sure you know we're on time here, but you know, various different uh, deployment patterns. You can deploy it in many different use cases. You know, workload consolidation, you've got legacy apps like SCADA, as I mentioned, maybe you're deploying you know, a, a, a edge component of one of the big clouds or your own kind of containerized TensorFlow models or whatever, uh, some sort of controller on the back end, uh, and that controller could be on-prem or in the back end. Um, SaaS or otherwise. Uh, edge router, we see people deploying it with some, some network services and it becomes sort of like the, this appliance for secure proxy on the network. This is similar, the last one is similar to the first one, but it's about security analytics, you know, out of band using a span port. I'm kind of sniffing traffic on the network. Um, you know, like maybe you have an intrusion detection system, sort of AI based threat analytics, you, you know, any number of things. And Eve is just that kind of one framework you need that's built for the IoT Edge. You know, 256 megs of memory, single node up to a small cluster as we evolve the project. And, and that's all you need. And then, and then you take your choice of apps. So as a, as a roadmap, you know, we're always looking to shrink the footprint. Um, you know, I think we're, we're comfortable in a gig today with, with apps. Of course, it varies what apps you're running. Uh, you can run it and even less. And what we always want to get kind of that lower point of the smart device edge, the IoT component. Uh, we've been increasing modularity. Initially, we were kind of opinionated as a community. We had um, KV or um, Zen as the hypervisor. Well, we had people wanting to go uh, implement KVM, but then also Acorn, which is an open source um, uh, hypervisor, very lightweight that can support mixed criticality workloads. Uh, we basically made it modular. So you take your pick. And if you only want to run containers and you just take it out. Uh, we're not trying to you know, reinvent the wheel. We've, we've adopted Container D as the most popular runtime. You know, we're, we're bridging to Kubernetes, as I mentioned. If you're into Kubernetes, come join us, and and we'll we'll talk about that that bridge. But also make sure that it's built on a secure foundation. That when you're not in a data center, uh, mesh networking, you know, kind of edge to uh, edge to edge capabilities. So this is the evolution. Again, not in the data path. We are complementary to these other projects. Uh, go to the web, uh, Raspberry Pi support. You're not really legit if you don't you know, run on a Raspberry Pi for developers. So to think of what, there's an image there, go go, go to town. Um, community update, uh, we're at about 50 unique contributors. We've been growing uh, uh, you know, quite uh, regularly. We've got deployments out in a number of industry contexts. And um, you know we're always working to collaborate with other projects, EdgeX, uh, Fledge, uh, Open Horizon, which has a, you know, a, a controller that even competes with our own commercial offer. But at the same time, you know, we're all better off if we figure out these sort of standard bases that that we can um, that we can uh, uh, you know uh, or accelerate in our innovations, as I mentioned up front. Uh, some key key links here. Um, you know, just go go to LF Edge and you know, Eve, and you'll find all these things. T uh, open um, um, TSC meetings, like all of these projects. It's about you know meritocracy. Technically, the best way to vote is with your your keyboard and write code. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to the, the panel uh, discussion um, and get it kicked off and, and uh, I'll let me advance it for you. There we go. All right, yeah, uh, the team will uh, lead, lead you guys through a discussion on innovation um, kind of spurred up by the 5G transition. All right, thank you. All right, Jason, thank you very much, Jason. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, a uh, big thanks for joining this LF Edge uh, panel. Uh, my name is uh, Balaji Etirajilu, and I work at Ericsson. Uh, I'll be moderating this panel. Uh, so just a quick talk about myself. Uh, I spend most of my time in 5G orchestration, network slicing, and edge areas. I also uh, serve the LF Edge as a marketing chair. And uh, before I start this panel, I would like to, by the way, we put together great panelists uh, across the industries, right? Uh, starting from chip makers, uh, operators, and uh, many other areas, different vertical segments. And uh, now I'm going to introduce my panel. Panelists, uh, just raise your hand. Uh, so as soon as you, you, you hear your name. Uh, first is Kandan. Uh, Kandan is a director at the uh, AT&T Labs, and he also leads innovations of 5G and edge computing. Uh, in addition to working at AT&T, he also serves as a TSE, uh, chair for uh, uh, a Crano project, 
and also is a member of the Technical Advisory uh, Committee uh, Council at Linux Foundation. My next speaker is uh, Renu Navale. Uh, Renu, hi. Uh, so Renu is the Vice President in the Data Platforms Group, and uh, she's also General Manager of the Edge Computing and Ecosystem Division at Intel. My next speaker is Sandeep. Hi, Sandeep. Yes. Uh, Sandeep is a Global Product Manager at HP. He's leading the HP product solution strategy within the retail solution global business unit. Uh, my next speaker is uh, Sajit Balraj. Hi, Sajit. Uh, we don't see your video, but we see your face. Uh, Sajit is the director of uh, XR product management at, uh, for Qualcomm Technologies. Now, first of all, I really thank all my panelists for taking time and joining us uh, for this interesting conversation around Edge. I want to just uh, talk about a little bit about uh, uh, our topic, then I'm going to start asking questions to my panel. Uh, as we all know, uh, you know, 5G deployment has already started, and uh, obviously it's going to bring a tremendous monetization opportunities across all industries, right? Not just uh, telco industry. Uh, just to remind everyone, 5G is not just about the radio technologies. It also includes edge computing, orchestration, automation, uh, network slicing, uh, AI, ML, uh, many different technologies. They're all part of the 5G. 5G will leverage all of those technologies. With all these technologies coming together with 5G, we can enable the whole entire 5G networks as a platform and expose that to various industries and applications, right? So that can actually create so many new business models and use cases uh, that can actually serve the, you know, almost all industries. So in these panels, we talk about uh, you know, business models, use cases, uh, monetization potential, and also touch upon open source. Okay, with that, uh, I would like to ask, you know, direct my first question to Kandan, actually. Kandan, if you're ready, uh, you know, as you know, uh, you are from at and and there are a lot of expectations created by the 5G and Edge, including, you know, we hear a lot about Acreno. Now, as the TSC chair of Acreno Edge Stack, can you share your key insights, uh, how you plan to support this technical evolution and also uh, the business model, business opportunity that Acreno opens it up? Thank you, Balaji. It's a great question. Um, so what is Acreno really doing with respect to you know, supporting the edge computing? As you have heard in the introduction presentation that I just did a few minutes before, and uh, there are a lot of open source in the industry. And what is really required is the fully integrated stack for a specific solution. And taking each individual open source and putting together is a big effort. That's what Acrino is primarily doing it right now. So we had two releases already, and the release three is actually expected this month. In release two, Acrino delivered multiple blueprints, what we call as a fully integrated stack for a specific solutions uh, that including several use cases of telcos, uh, either it is access or core or a mix sort of a deployment or customer uh, home sort of a deployments like SD-WAN or universal CPE, those sort of deployments. Uh, Acrino had a solution in release two. The release two came in in January uh, 2020. And uh, these blueprints are fully integrated and, again, community tested on a specific configuration profile that the blueprint claimed to support for, for that particular edge use case. And these, there is a documentation available for a user to use it. The key aspect is that you know, having a fully integrated solution supported by an open source community, that is a very key for you know, the implementation speed and automation that is required by edge computing and 5G. And any industry who needs it, uh, they need the fully integrated solution. And that's what Acrino really sub provides it. So what does it mean for users? This is actually provides a low cost solution because the community fully integrates it. So the users can really see what does it mean to have a full fully integrated solution. Uh, the second thing is that it creates a full ecosystem of uh, uh, vendors and companies, you know, who who consume these blueprints and make a product out of it, 
and also provide support as an open source platform, which is actually a needed thing for production deployment for uh, many industries, that including telcos and enterprise. And also, it's very important to you know promote the innovations uh, that is needed in the 5G and as well as the uh, as well as the enterprise application. And that means that uh, there need to be a collaboration between a lot of open source communities together and standard bodies, something like HC Mac, 3GPP, and uh, those are all needed to make innovation happen faster. That's what Akraino community does. And it provides like solutions like AR, VR, connected, connected vehicle, uh, AI, ML at the edge. And instead of having things in the paperwork, this community really delivers in a fully working code. I think that's a powerful thing this community brings into the industry. Thank you, Kandan. Uh, that's good that you brought up standards as well. Yes, a lot of collaboration between open source and standards bodies as well. That's key. And um, uh, now I'll move to my, you know, uh, the next question. I would like to, you know, uh, direct this to uh, Mr. Sandeep here. But before that, audience, uh, uh, please also you can ask the panelists questions. Uh, please uh, type them in the chat and we'll take it one by one, uh, those questions. Uh, please feel free to do that. So Sandeep, uh, I do understand, uh, you know, looking at your background, you're spending a tremendous amount of time uh, putting together the business model and use cases for the retail industry. Uh, and can you share some details how you are leveraging in terms of the business model and use cases that you are, you know, driving toward the retail industry how you're planning to leverage 5G, age, and AI to solve some of the problems or improve the normal life, uh, you know, the experience that we get from the retail industry. Yep, thanks, Balaji. I think uh, you're right. We are definitely hard at work at HP, focused on retail and some other verticals. Uh, so let me specifically describe the state of retail, right? So when it comes to retail, it's, uh, you know, we can arguably say that it's one of the industries that is most transformed by technology, at least more, more than many others. And uh, today it starts with a very savvy shopper who really has any info they need at their fingertips. And with e-commerce, we have seen they are used to that personalization as well as efficiency of any kind of goods or service delivery that they are, they are demanding. And for a while now, brick and mortar retailers have been investing to respond to this, both in customer personalization as well as operational efficiencies. And they are digitizing their stores with several different types of sensors, analyzing that data to create some insights that the store managers or associates can track. So in that setting, uh, we are talking about problem statements in retail, like uh, inventory management, customer engagement, or let's say theft detection or promotion effect, and just to name a few, and there are many others. And there, are, there have been some challenges here, mostly with cloud-based solutions. Many retailers may not want to get logged into a cloud service for a variety of reasons. It may be the cost or control over the data privacy or connectivity or even latency, right? So one of the major challenges uh, were, were just the proliferation of many different types of sensors, proprietary protocols and cloud interfaces, which created several siloed implementations. And we are happy that LF Edge actually has provided that open framework now that we just saw Jim uh, go over that is both sensor agnostic and cloud agnostic. And HP wanted to be part of this to help push this ecosystem forward. So ISVs don't need to build custom solutions that either cannot scale or end up being costly and they cannot take one implementation to the next one. So with now 5G and edge compute solutions, retailers can solve several of these problems on their premises. They can get a you know ready to go edge compute that keeps their data under their control without worrying about privacy or even connectivity. And with the right sensor and insights engine recipe, that is for their use case of choice, they can process all that data locally and create real-time actionable insights, either for the store manager or associates or really all the way to the back end of the corporate. And we think this is going to bring a you know big opportunity to move this industry even more forward. And it will have several business models for the ISVs, for the resellers, the value chain partners across the board. And uh, really excited, you know, to be working on this at this point in time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Hi, Sajit. Uh, do you hear me? 
Yeah, Balaji, I can hear you. Thank you, Sajid. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you know, I know you are uh, highly experienced uh, based on your profile in the AR, VR areas and a lot of use cases uh, that you are involved. And, you know, uh, the virtual reality and the augmented reality, they are pretty interesting areas where, uh, you know, uh, the you know that uh, use case and new business model coming out of that uh, specific two you know cluster of use cases uh you know that leverages uh, 5g the edge extreme latency is very critical and also private networks right uh, they all play a major role uh to 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 deliver this ar vr experience across wide variety of industries and different use cases right now we see a tremendous opportunity and potential in this area from your experience, how do you see this whole ecosystem, AR, VR, developing? Yeah, thanks, Balaji. Um, and first of all, I want to apologize uh, just for the lack of video, some last minute <laughs> technical glitches with the camera. Uh, but yeah, just going back to your question, Balaji. Um, yeah, so one of the things that we are seeing is we're seeing a lot of interest in AR and VR in the enterprise. Um, you know. I think the main use cases we are seeing uh, in as it relates to enterprise are around uh, training, uh, remote assistance, and data visualization and collaboration. Um, and then what's happening is uh, today, basically enterprises are using um, you know two types of headsets uh, for these uh, for realizing these use cases. Uh, one is a PC uh, tethered headset, uh, and then the other one is a standalone headset. Um, and the PC tethered headset is essentially, uh, you know, a, a device where you have a, a headset and all of the processing is done on a on a high end PC, and you know the user is connected to the PC uh, via a cable. Uh, you know these these uh, devices actually deliver extremely high quality, um, you know, close to photorealistic experiences. However, uh, you need a dedicated setup, right? Uh, and you also have these cables that actually limit uh, the utility. Uh, the other, the other uh, type of device is a standalone headset. Uh, now standalone headsets are uh, devices where all of the processing is done on the headset. Um, you know, these devices are flexible. Uh, you can use them anywhere. Uh, and you know, they're not constrained by a cable or you know, the need to have a dedicated setup. Uh, so really, if you think about it, you know, the ideal scenario is to have the best of both, right? So you have the flexibility and ease of use of the standalone headset uh, combined with, uh, you know, the processing power of the PC, right? Uh, and this is where, you know, 5G and edge compute comes in, um, you know, so now with 5G and edge compute, you can think about, you know, the 5G, uh, uh, you know, high throughput, low latency link acting as this bus right uh, that connects you know processing on the standalone headset and augments it with uh, processing available on the edge right so in terms of what we see so now we see really the next step in terms of evolution of ar and vr uh, in the enterprise is to move to a 5g enabled headset um, and you you're going to see um, you know initially a bespoke on-prem deployment where you'll have specific use cases for a specific set of users that are going to be realized by an on-prem 5G enabled headset with edge compute, right? And then eventually what's going to happen is you're going to have numerous use cases, right? With all sorts of use cases uh, and, um, you know, multiple users on the same system. And that's where you're going to see features like network slicing become very important because you have to maintain the quality of users. Um, as you basically scale uh, these deployments, right? So, so, so in summary, that's sort of the way we see it, right? So you have existing standalone PC uh, VR systems that uh, and uh, that are being used to realize these use cases, transitioning to you know um, you know on-prem 5G uh, 5G uh, connectivity and edge compute, and then followed by you know the scaling, uh, you know, to multiple use cases and and multiple users. Yeah, thank you, Sajid. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the network slicing can create, uh, uh, you know, a specific slice uh, for uh, within enterprise, maybe five, six slices. Uh, one could be for the VR use case. Uh, one could be for different other use cases. 
and also uh, you can expose the capability uh, to the third party, maybe to other drone providers, to the gaming industry, right? There are many options. Now, I would like to uh, move to uh, Renu. Uh, Renu, uh, you are the last person I'm asking the question. Uh, so you, pr you probably need to, you know, you heard what others are saying. But here, uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, what I see, uh, you spend a lot of time in building uh, the edge ecosystem and also software and platforms, and also worked in the open source industry as well. How do you see the open source and many other technologies help to create uh, you know, different business models uh, in solving the enterprise uh, problems and use cases? Now, you can feel free to talk uh, you know, open now, any business model, any use case that uh, we have not covered until now, right? Sure. Uh, thank you, Balaji. And I think um, uh, I know the panelists before um, already reiterate, you know, they, they spoke about a number of the benefits of open source and edge computing. So I'll, I'll reiterate a few things. Um, the first thing is um, when we think about edge computing and what it is, um, it's really about harnessing the data um, at the edge close to the origin of data. Um, and it, it is to drive, uh, you know, efficiencies in the enterprises new business models, new you know, monetization models, and also to deliver new types of services or revenue opportunities for, for the uh, industry. Uh, at, the, at the base of it all, the, under, the, the most important thing is harnessing this data for you know, these monetization capabilities or business models. And in order to do that, you know, the technology underpinning is so critical um, to harness this data. And the technology underpinning, in addition to hardware, in my opinion, one of the most important pieces is open source software and open source innovation, as well as open source communities like you have in LFH. Um, uh, when we look at all the different use cases, um, each of these use cases requires, you know, a fairly unique, um, you know, supply chain, you know, ecosystem value chain, you know, retail industry versus. Um, uh, so I think it looks like my uh, audio is not that great. So maybe I'll speak no, uh, through the phone. No, 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 no. Oh, it's now it's good. Okay. Um, so so let me continue. So, so when we look at all the um, uh, you know various use cases, they are actually a convergence of you know IT, OT, as well as CT or communications technology workloads, and this extends not only from the on-premises or IoT edge uh, with use cases like enterprise, private wireless, or private mobility, but also onto the service provider or the telco edge. Um, and, and for all of this convergence, again, you know, our open source uh, communities or projects like Akreno are so important because one of the most important things, like Kandan said, was it, it, is, it is the integration of the various workloads um, in order to. Um, let me try again. <laughs> um, it, it's the Yes. Thank you. You will now be placed into conference. You're seeing that not only with... Uh, with Sorry, we are some, uh, some echo.
Okay. Uh, okay. I think there is some extra feed is in the line. I think. Is is this uh, is this better? Yeah. Now it's fantastic. Okay. So um, uh, so in addition to uh, integrating uh, all of these workloads to deliver on the use cases. Some of the work that the Crano community is doing is tremendous, right? We one of one one example is the um, uh, the integrated cloud native blueprint uh, that a number of ecosystem partners, um, uh, you know, including Intel, uh, they we submitted uh, where uh, it it not only enables various network functions but also various edge and 5G functions. Uh, on various Kubernetes clusters. Uh, the same thing we're seeing extending even to the on-premises edge where there is use of you know, Kubernetes for UCPE and other types of uh, workloads where, again, you want to integrate um, edge applications and services in addition to the, um, to the network functions. So, so I, I, in my opinion, I think um, um, the open source community, the open source innovations, uh, all of that serves as a tremendous catalyst for the ecosystem community, and it you know it really helps accelerate um, our time to market and time to deployment uh, for the various business models and monetization models. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we do we do have a few more minutes left uh, for the panel. If uh, somebody wants to jump in uh, in those. Uh, Please feel free to uh, from the panelists, right? Uh, please, uh, please jump in and uh, add some more comments. Anyone can take the question. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you very much uh, for for the uh, you know thank you panelists uh, for for sharing your views. Uh, to shape up this 5G and AJ area. And uh, now I will hand over to Matt, who will talk about LF Edge uh, more, more in detail. Hello, everybody. Where's my, uh, my video? <laughs> there, we, there we are. Okay, so... Um, Good morning. My name is Matt Trefero, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Vapor.io. But uh, for the context of this call, I co-chair a Linux Foundation project called State of the Edge. Um, the State of the Edge is uh, one of the top-level projects at the uh, the Linux Foundation's LF Edge, and it's a uh, it's it's a pretty unique project uh, when looking at at open source. And uh, one of the things that I'm I'm really excited about is how. Um, the Linux Foundation has has uh, embraced these innovations in open source, and uh, so I'll tell you a little bit of the history of State of the Edge and what we're looking to do now. So um, the the mission of the State of the Edge is uh, to is very simple. It's that to provide free information, free research um, that is vendor neutral and can be used by all to accelerate the edge computing industry. And um, we founded this organization. Uh, back in 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 2007, um, and it was founded by uh, Jacob Smith and myself. Uh, Jacob is the CMO of Packet, uh, which is now owned by Equinix, uh, and we had uh, a number of other organizations: uh, Arm, Edge Gravity, Rafe, a bunch of other folks that helped uh, uh, underwrite the work. And we hired some uh, uh, some analysts and got a lot of volunteers and put together a. Um, almost a 65 page report that was designed to level set the industry on what the trends were, what the, the background was and all that. And one of the, the interesting things, and this was 2017, uh, and the first report was published in 2018. And one of the interesting things back then is the, uh, there was a lot of frothiness in the terminology. It, it you know, it, it, if you were here earlier when Jason Shepard gave his presentation on the LF Edge taxonomy, um, every organization that had anything even remotely to do with Edge, or even if they thought they had something to do with Edge, had uh, released uh, uh, a a diagram, a set of terms, uh, you know, and it was it, they were all over the place. I mean, it, just different terms. And so we were trying to write a book that 
that spanned all of these efforts and we couldn't figure out which terms we should use. So we created uh, a glossary that we just use internally and uh, we sent it around to a lot of peers and got feedback and said, you know, is this the right definition of access edge? Is this the right definition of this? In some cases we made up words because there wasn't anything to accurately describe it or the words that were in place were, um, you know, overused uh, to mean too many different things. And um, out of that came this document that was this glossary for edge computing. And uh, I thought maybe there was an opportunity to turn this into an open source project. So I approached the Linux Foundation and I said, I have this glossary. It's got a lot of peer support. Um, it's vendor neutral. It's technology neutral. Um, uh, what about putting it in a GitHub repo, slapping a Creative Commons license on it and um, treating it as an open source project? And the Linux Foundation, to their credit, uh, accepted it as a project. Um, it became one of the founding projects of LF Edge uh, when LF Edge launched, and um, it, it was a, a, a you know a powerful force uh, in the industry. And then um, you know we 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 continued to publish our reports, uh, but Jacob and I had always had the vision of finding a long term steward uh, for this project. So at the end of last year, we approached the Linux Foundation and said, you know, couldn't we contribute the entirety of State of the Edge uh, to the Linux Foundation? And that was completed earlier this year. Um, the Open Glossary project was renamed the State of the Edge, and now we have a, a number of activities under there. So just to, to show you what uh, is available, um, so you know, we founded this in 2017. Um, in 2018, uh, we first published the Open Glossary of Edge Computing. Uh, that became that open source project. We then published our first State of the Edge report. It's available for free at stateoftheedge.com. Uh, it's a, still a very relevant and accurate document, uh, in my opinion. So I think it's if you're looking for a broad overview of edge computing and how to think about it and frame it, I think it's a good document. We also created uh, an edge computing landscape. And the original version was just a hand laid out uh, PDF file. Um, but as we migrated that to the Linux Foundation, it's now a dynamic landscape, um, which you can see the early versions of it. It hasn't uh, gotten to V10 yet, uh, but you go to landscape.lfedge.org, and there's this dynamic landscape. It's based on the the system that the CNCF uh, created, which is a database driven. You can slice and dice the landscape as many ways as you want. Um, if you represent a company or an open source project and it's not on the landscape, uh, you can have it added. There's instructions on the LF Edge wiki. So if you go to the landscape page, you can uh, find those. Uh, if you can't find them, you can send me an email or hit me on Twitter and I'm happy to help. Um, but we'd like to get every relevant company and project uh, on the landscape. Um, in uh, uh, the beginning of uh, 2019, we published um, a topic specific report. Um, we did it in partnership with some research that Seagate produced called Date at the Edge. That also is available under a Creative Commons license uh, from the state of the edge.com. And then um, most recently, at the end of December last year, we published the State of the Edge 2020 report. Um, and uh, and we, we have plans to publish a 2021 report this year. Uh, the 2020 report is a uh, uh, pretty ambitious. We built a forecast model for uh, IT infrastructure and data center infrastructure um, to support the growth in edge computing and all the use cases. And it's uh, I think it's a pretty interesting uh, opinion, um, but it's based on, on, on some pretty buttoned up research done by an independent analyst. Um, and so it's at least fun to look at and think about. And, you know, it's a model, so it's definitely wrong, but it's probably directionally right. The, um, so now the State of the Edge has, has three uh, working groups, um, which will seem familiar based on what I already said. We have a research working group, which is responsible for producing and publishing the reports. As I mentioned, we just kicked off the planning for the 2021 report. Uh, if you have interest, you should join the, 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 the mailing list. Um, we're going to be doing some surveying and uh, some brainstorming on uh, what topic we should cover. Um, we're open to just about anything. Uh, we'll try to be responsive to the community and the other LF Edge projects. Uh, we also have the Open Glossary of Edge Computing, um, which uh, was recently updated uh, pretty significantly to uh, fully align with the LF Edge white paper and the LF Edge taxonomy that Jason mentioned. So um, we're still doing some cleaning up on that, but the Open Glossary uh, now 
uh, represents, spans, you know, all the projects of LF Edge and is the sort of canonical representation of uh, how the, the LF Edge uh, suggests we use certain terms. Uh, again, it's an open source project. So if you see something you don't like or you see something that's missing, you can create an issue in GitHub or, uh, you know, create a pull request. Uh, we're happy to look at all of those and evolve it. Definitely a community driven project. And then, as I mentioned, we have this Edge landscape at landscape.lfedge.org uh, um, that we're creating. And um, that is uh, the essence of Stay the Edge. Uh, it is a, if you have an appetite uh, in involving yourself in an open source project that, uh, you know, is relatively easy to get on the ground floor, this is, this is it. Uh, if you have people on your team that maybe are in their marketing department or, you know, are technical managers that have some some language skills that might want to participate, that's a great way, pay, way for people who, who, you know, aren't necessarily prepared to commit code uh, to participate in the community. And, uh, you know, I'm super excited to now be a part of the Linux Foundation and part of LF Edge. It's a really great organization. So I will now hand this back to uh, Arpit Joshapura to take us to the the, the next uh, the next presentation. All right, thank you very much, uh, and uh, Matt, appreciate all the effort. So as we bring in the uh, final section of of today's uh, mini summit, uh, I'm I'm really happy that you know. I would say 90% of you have stayed through the, the, the online, which is unheard of, right? Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a few of the projects that are very exciting, uh, but they, they, they are in the early stages uh, or they're in the growth stage. So you've heard from the uh, uh, key projects, stage three, uh, Acreno and EdgeX, also heard from Eve and State of the Edge. So I'm gonna cover the rest of them today. Uh, in very brief overview. But what I do want to emphasize here is you're seeing an ecosystem of premium members who are behind or the driving force behind the LF Edge. And you can see from the, 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 the premium members that it, uh, it, it represents a very wide variety and a cross section of the community. Uh, you know, silicon agnostics, you know, ARM, Intel, Qualcomm. You got, you know, the cloud players, uh, you know, uh, you got Baidu and Tencent, and you got the uh, telecom players, AT and T, NTT, Equinix, etc. And you know you got the industrials, you know GE, OSI, Soft, Dynamic. I mean, very very good cross section. And then you have the end-to-end uh, -end system players as well. So uh, effectively, this community is shaping up very nicely. We saw almost 150 percent growth in the developer community in uh, in the last quarter. And my theory is, you know, as as technical people, work is the best form of distraction given the pandemic. So we're seeing a very steady increase in growth in, in the developer community. So let me hit on some of these key projects. And I will only hit the highlights. Uh, each of these project details are on the wiki and feel free to, you know, connect with the PTLs. So let me start off with the Home Edge. Home Edge is a project. And think of it this way, you know, it's a it's a Samsung contribution, but it, think of it inside our homes, you got all these connected devices. And historically, people would say, oh, yeah, it's a TV and it has its set top. And then there's Nest and ther thermostats came in and now fridges talk and every and, and then you have the personal assistants in the house. Right. Um, all of these create their own frameworks, their own APIs and a cluster of um, of of unrelated uh, frameworks, if you may, inside the house. Now, couple that with the fact that there is no IT in uh, manager in the house, right? Number one. Number two, uh, the next-gen services inside are now more two ways. They take advantage of latency, so they could be surveillance services, they could be uh, you know, public uh, urgent broadcast, they could be security, they could be a whole variety of things. So what this project is doing is it's enabling a very simple framework uh, that allows the house or inside the house uh, to sort of run applications on top, utilizing common sort of open source code, right? Uh, things like how do I service offload uh, when a device doesn't have the capabilities, right? That is inside. Uh, and I'm looking at some of the use cases here. Uh, how do you maintain low latency without sacrificing the privacy, right? There's a lot of uh, data that is inside that you don't want to leave. 
so those are the kind of the things that the uh, home edge team is working on uh, they have the first release that came out last year the next one called coconut is planned uh, a lot of vpn data storage modules etc uh, and and feel free to join and participate this one of our uh, you know budding projects the next project that i want to talk about is Beetle. Uh, so as I said, LF Edge is, you know, an entity or a framework that allows uh, Cloud Edge, Enterprise Edge, you know, all these various markets, if you may, that each have a ha have a stake in the ground for the edge to come together. So think of Beetle coming from a cloud perspective. And it is it is uh, a very general purpose platform that has allowed very light and secure applications that need to scale to be pushed out to the edge. And again, this is from a cloud-centric view of things, right? And so things like drone processing or things like AI ML, uh, you know, just pushing it down so that AI can do visual inspection of video images, right? Uh, and all that needs to be done in a zero touch remote management case right so so you got all the architecture diagrams which again you don't need to be an expert on this but uh the general goal of this project is to you know be independent of the hardware right so x86 arms miss mips etc independent of the os and then you know push in services uh all the way to ai ml video and things like that okay now beetle um, is coming out with uh, with uh, as a container uh, just you know mid 2020 and a lot of remote management capabilities is included in this so you know feel free to participate on that you know good contribution happening there as well and then we have fledge which is a, a very fast uh, upcoming project where uh, think of and if you look at Jason's diagram or the diagram I started with you know, you saw the user edge in sort of three buckets, right? It's the constraint, the sort of the smart device edge, and then the on-prem kind of mini data center type edge. You know, think of this as, as kind of very extreme in terms of industrial edge. And uh, any, any things that uh, allow or, or need uh, to be deployed as a framework uh, to, uh, to the turbines and to the motors and the transformers and things like that, right? In, inside the plants, the factories, the mines, etc. Uh, that's what that's where Fledge helps, and you know anomaly dis detection, machine learning, etc. is all kind of in included here. Uh, in a recent release, sort of the Google Cloud TensorFlow uh, integration was also supported, and and I think the summary of of the release is really around you know manufacturing energy, weight, water, uh, oil and gas, right? So uh, constrained environment pluggable microservices, uh, and you can see that uh, this is also one of the growing projects here at LF Edge. And then finally, uh, I want to highlight uh, a project that just got in uh, called Open Horizon. Uh, uh, it's a, you know, a seed from, from IBM. And this, this is an interesting project because you know, the scale at which you need to push uh, containers and and the number of locations you know ten thousand upwards whatever is 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 something that you want to do it very seamlessly right so from a compute device to a management hub and vice versa right so and and when you do that you need to include the ml models in it right and you want to make sure that uh, if if the devices are constrained then they appropriately understand that so how do you write the policy for that how do you uh, make it fully autonomous so that the agent can run on every node, every device, sorry, to enable it. And then, you know, the lifecycle management is all, all created in the back end, right? And how do you do it autonomously? So these are kind of the things that uh, the project Open Horizon is, is solving. Uh, it was launched into Q2 and it's being incubated also uh, as a stage one project. So you can see from the feel of, uh, you know, LF Edge and the projects that we talked about uh, that our goal as LF Edge is to harmonize and unify the communities. Whether you have a perspective of an IoT, whether you have a perspective of an enterprise, whether you have the perspective of a cloud service provider or a telco, right? And there are technologies like AIML, uh, 5G, uh, 
you know, um, GPU, TPU, NPUs, right? Um, On-demand network slicing and things like that. They're all coming together to enable these projects to come up. Our projects are focused on the boring part, okay? So don't don't get too excited, but the boring part is the lifecycle management. It's the framework, it's the middleware, it's the plumbing layer. Many, many words for it, okay? It's non-differentiated software, which by the way, constitutes for almost 70 to 80% of the code. And I would say 300% of the headaches for deployment in terms of interoperability and things like that. So uh, that's where open source shines, and that's where we have seen a huge, huge interest in our communities. Uh, our mandate from, from all the projects is to make sure that these projects are hardware independent, silicon independent, cloud independent, OS independent, protocol independent. I mean, you got 170, 180 messaging protocols. You know, we're not going to pick one, but we're going to abstract, right? So that you don't have to worry about it. You know, cloud connectivity, you can have so many clouds there. You don't have to worry about it, right? Uh, <clears throat> and I didn't put language independence, but <clears throat> you can write it in any language, uh, you know, coding software language. Uh, and so we're going to bring in the best of the telecom, cloud and enterprise edge, right? So location, latency, mobility, right? Uh, as I said, five to 20 milliseconds is the sweet spot. And as, as like any other umbrellas, it's hosted by Linux Foundation, uh, um, as an umbrella, right? So umbrella of many projects, eight and counting, and uh, you know a huge community to uh, work with. So you know if you if you got a good teaser, and if you believe you're not, you're already contributing, which I know several of you are not. Um, we'd love to for you to become a member. I mean that's an easy thing to do. Uh, but while you do that, uh, make sure to get a Linux Foundation ID. Go onto the wiki page. Join the workflows. Now, what do you do? You can do any of these things. You can attend meetings, attend events, just write test cases, participate in Blueprint, just quite ask questions, answer questions, right? Uh, and, and that's how you get into the community. So for people who are already familiar with open source, no issues. For people who are not, this is a very good uh, area to get started. Remember I said it's four times the size of cloud in terms of the market potential. So lots of money to be made and lots of activities going on. In fact, if you look at some of the Forbes uh, publications that happened in April and May post pandemic, or not post, but during the pandemic, uh, it was very clear that uh, the role of network and the role of edge, so 5G, IoT, and edge has significantly increased as we move to the next era. So with that said, I am going to pause here and I will remind everybody to ask questions in the chat box. We're going to answer them in the arrival. Uh, we're not going to prioritize any, but uh, we'll just keep answering them till we run out of questions. Uh, and with that said, I'm going to start off with a whole bunch of questions that have already been submitted. Uh, and I'll, I'll moderate again. There's a chat window. Please add, uh, uh, keep at asking Q&A. If you want to ask a specific question to a specific presenter today, please put the name in there and then I'll direct the question towards that person or that project. All right. Uh, so one of the first questions that uh, came out uh, was, can you do, um, and I'm not gonna speak uh, the name here just to, to keep the identity here, but, uh, uh, one of the first questions was, can you describe the Venn diagram of a Crano eVegX Foundry Fledge? How should users decide which projects should use? Should they use all of them? That's an excellent question. I'm gonna take a crack at it and I'll let, uh, you know, sort of Jason chime in. Uh, uh, but the, the, the fundamental assumption on how users decide is based on their use case. You know, start with the use case, look at blueprints that exist, Right. See what frameworks do you need? Right. What problem you're trying to solve? Um, and I think most of the users or end users go from that perspective and then start deciding the clear answer on should you use all of them? The answer is no. Uh, that is, uh, we have not seen a use case which will need all of the projects all at once. Um, th that's why the first diagram I showed where we briefly or roughly position these projects in the different 
definitions of the edge, right? Whether it's the user edge or the or the, the provider edge, and and then whether it's constrained smart edge or or um, uh, on prem. Uh, it kind of roughly gives you the outline of where it needs to be settled. So, J Jason, you want to add anything onto that since you've been doing a lot of uh, sort of uh, yeah. cross project work? Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Might be a. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, totally what you know, Arbit said. I mean, the goal here is to have all these projects. You know, again, we, we want to harmonize over time. There's a necessary reasons why there's always going to be some differences. You you make trade offs, hence why the taxonomy that we've developed as a community that I, I quickly tease come you'll know, come out next week with a really nice you know, white paper. Um, there's necessarily trade uh, trade offs that you make. Um, of course, there's some overlap between projects today, but we you know, we want to be an inclusive community and then kind of work together to go harmonize as it makes sense, while also recognizing the necessarily unique parts. And and as a community, you know, it's about being like I said before, valuable independently as projects, but better together. And and if you need just that lower level abstraction layer, great. You know, if you need that application interoperability framework, cool. You know, and and you want to use various degrees of proprietary. But if you over time as you use more of these projects together, you just have this more open foundation that you can build an open ecosystem around, which is I think is super important to grow the, to the true business potential uh, in, in any of the markets. Whether you call it edge, IoT, AI, whatever, it's just it's just business. Um, so yeah, that's why we think it's it's key that that this foundation that we're building of these abstraction layers uh, enable maximum flexibility for for your business going forward and minimize undifferentiated heavy lifting. Very good, thank you. Um, the next question was, what is supported software and hardware platforms targeted initially for LF Edge? Uh, so I believe this was during Kandan's and Akrino's presentation. So uh, Kandan, do you want to take a crack at this question uh, from maybe a Blueprints perspective? Yeah, sure. Uh, the hardware and software, it's really depend upon specific use case and uh, each blueprint get validated on a specific hardware that the blueprint uh, requirements are around and uh, you know it varies quite a bit actually from uh, different sizes of edge deployment to different uh, you know different implementation models and requirements around them so there is no one specific hardware or software again that's why we call us like an end-to-end -end stack uh, that including the hardware and if a, if a user is looking at the documentation of that particular blueprint, they can actually see what the hardware and uh, specific stack has been validated. And I think this applies to other uh, projects in LF Edge as well. And they articulate you know, what hardware that specific software has been certified with. So you should, should follow the, the document and the community guidance on how it is actually tested. That should articulate uh, what the hardware is. But again, from a community aspect of it, uh, we are not restricted to any specific hardware, especially anything on the open uh, compute hardware and the open source uh, varieties of hardware and any type of chipset uh, we would be able to support. I think that's what community is actually focused on. So there is no limitation, but the blueprint may be focused on specific type of hardware depending upon the use case. Thank you very much. Uh, I Back think, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I believe Jim might have answered this, but does, does LF uh, EdgeX support uh, OPC UA for the rest of the audience? Jim? Yeah, sure. And uh, the answer there is yes. Uh, we do have um, what we call a device service or a connector essentially for OPC UA, one in Go and one in C. They're still just being uh, reviewed right now. So I think we'll see them probably hit the next release, which is our fall release, but you can get the early code. And I think to the, the folks who asked that question, I put the links in the chat window, um, but please feel free to reach out and can help you more. We also have commercial implementations. I know in my own company, we have a commercial implementation of EdgeX that offers um, OPC UA connectors today. Very good, thank you. Uh, there was a question or there's a question around most of these presentations talk uh, at the talks about uh, IOT use cases, but edge is more than IOT and we 100% agree with that. Uh, any comments at the forums that focuses on other use cases. Uh, so as we said, right, not all IOT is edge. Edge has uh, you know, a series of other use cases beyond IOT or, or that 
uh, and I think um, it'll be clear if you go through the blueprints yeah. in the Rocaino, uh it has at, it has several non-IoT uh, use cases as well. Uh, so absolutely agree. And yeah, I mean, I, uh, the I, forum, yeah, if you want to add, yes, go ahead. I mean, I'll offer something. I obviously want to give others a chance to talk, but like, um, yeah, absolutely. And that's why the taxonomy, you know, says smart device edge and not IoT edge, you know, for sure. Like we oh, yeah. as a community believe, you know, that edge has a lot, a lot of different use cases. The IoT edge is a subcomponent of the smart device edge. IoT use cases tend to be upload centric, whereas, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-IoT use cases like clients, smartphones tend to be download centric and you just need different considerations. And that's the type of stuff that Acrano is looking at and, and other projects. And, you know, so there's there's a mix of all of the above. IoT is like a workload under edge, but there's a lot more than that. Thank you. And while Jason, you're at it, there was a next question for you as well. Why is Eve not using yeah. Yocto project for integration? Uh, it seems to have custom packaging. Well, we use, like Grub. Yeah. Yeah, we use, you know, uh, you know, obviously Linux as a, a baseline. Um, Yocto, we're working with some folks in Yocto about how do you run Yocto up above? And as some people qualify their stacks on, on Yocto OS or, or, you know, any number of Linux distributions. Um, and then also, um, if there's more specific questions, you'll know, get involved, join the, join the TSC and let's talk. Again, we're not trying to be different, just to be different. We're, we're making technology choices based on what the community is driving and what we think is the right thing to do for the industry. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, all right, again, there's a couple of minutes left. If you want to squeeze in any of your final questions, uh, we, we have a few more. Um, I would like to, uh, you know, ask uh, Renu a question since she, we had some audio issues there. But uh, one thing I want to highlight on the call itself is the chair for the governing board uh, on, on LF Edge is, is Melissa. She's from Intel. Uh, I think the TAC chair is from Intel, Jimson Ledger, and, and you know, Renu is supporting a lot of things. So uh, first of all, thank you really for, for driving this ecosystem forward. Uh, but uh, one of the things that has come up in terms of you know uh, retail uh, initiatives that uh, Intel is working very closely on on AJAX and and things like that from a use case perspective. Uh, how do you see you know that market evolving given where we are today? Because I think the the code is there. A lot of these uh, you know businesses have are where we are, but you know we are we are ready from a software perspective. So uh, any 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 thoughts on that? So I think, um, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, I know we had a lot of issues. Can you hear me okay? Hello, can you hear me okay? Oh, okay. So so you can hear me okay. Um, so I know the retail industry has definitely been, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's been going through some uncertain times with the, with the pandemic. Uh, but as we think about, you know, the benefits of um, what not only open source can do, but also edge computing and 5G can do for the retail industry in terms of um, completely reinvigorating or revitalizing, um, you know, the whole customer experience, the shopping experience, the ability to, you know, again, uh, uh, you know, drive uh, efficiencies in the supply chain, um, as well as being able to deliver a, a variety of different types of um, virtual or online experiences. So when we think about the possibilities of 5G edge computing, as well as you know, open source and ecosystem innovation, um, I do believe that you know, hey, the, the times will change for the retail industry, and you know, we we will all. I, I do believe that the industry. Is has an opportunity to you know really go through like a in strategic inflection point where it can truly change the entire customer experience as well as the virtual or online experience for um, for the various uh, uh, for, for the shopping experiences uh, that the retail industry can offer. So that's that's my belief. I know the the software is ready, the ecosystem is there. Um, you know, I think um, you know we. We as a population will not, you know, stop using the retail industry for a variety of different products. So I think I do believe that 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 industry will go through a strategic inflection point and and use technology in different ways to deliver much better experiences than 
uh, and and the customer engagement um, engagement um, strategies. Thank you very much. And you were coming loud and clear this time. So thank you. Uh, I think with that said, I think we are, uh, I think the rest of the questions were, you know, will the session be recorded? Will the slides be uploaded? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think there's one more question. We'll probably see if we can take it offline, but uh, uh, is it possible to provide uh, required service uptime in container-based services? So this is probably a longer question on uh, on uh, uptime for container-based services. So this is more on SLAs and things like that. I think several of these blueprints are looking at a hard uptime requirement as well, service uptime requirements. Um, whether it's containers or VM is is kind of just a technology implementation. Uh, but kind of if you can answer in like five ten seconds, uh, if if that is true or not. Uh, otherwise, we can take that offline with uh, with the uh, person asking. No, I think you touched on the the exact point that it's base, basically based on specific requirements that the blueprint is trying to address, and it's always not exactly the same. And uh, also the resiliency come into a lot of uh, uh, a lot of play with respect to the overall availability. It could be a, a site level, or it could be a a, a specific uh, hardware level, or it could be something you know multi-site level. There's a, there's a lot of uh, play come into uh, uh, into implementation uh, in assuring the overall SLA of a platform. And I think it's not only applies for specifically the the um, the blueprints, but also the upstream software, right? So because uh, Krino ba is based on most of the projects are based on the upstream software that including uh, Kubernetes and other software that our friends talked on the LF Edge and, uh, um, you know, things that we get from, for example, OpenStack. So I think in combination okay. of all this thing, the blueprints looks at the overall availability needed and it addresses them. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So uh, if we have not answered questions, we'll take that offline. But thank you very much to everybody for answering the Q&A and thank you for sticking around. I think we're, we're done from, from a timing perspective.